Hi, I'm Sal McCaglano, Associate Professor of History at Campbell University, uh, former Merchant Mariner, and an adjunct professor in Maritime Industry Policy at the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy. And welcome to the uh, April 9th edition of What's Going On in the Suez. So a couple of things uh, going on in the Suez here today really want to talk about. So first off, uh, Ever Given, still in the Suez, uh, still anchored there. Suez Canal Authority is completing their investigation. Other agencies are on board doing their investigation. Uh, Panamanian Registry is on board. Insurance companies are on board doing it. And the Egyptians have announced that they are still not planning to release the vessel unless uh, they're guaranteed a billion dollars in damages for uh, issues associated with the closure of the canal. They have not been able to substantiate what their billion dollars is and why they want it. Uh, it's not exactly clear that they've suffered a billion dollars worth of loss. Uh, the p and insurance is the protection and indemnity insurance, which is the uh, UK uh, p and club, has already started talking about uh, potentials of, of having to deal with cases. And p and is a structured uh, entity which covers different levels at different uh, uh, different points. And so there was an article in Marine Link, uh, and I'll have it in the show notes here, that discuss it and, and what happens if P&I insurance goes up, you know, the 100 million, 1 billion, 2 billion, 3 billion mark, how they go about covering that. Uh, they're being optimistic. They don't think that it's going to reach that level by any means, but that's what insurance companies do. They tend to be optimistic about it. So a uh, lot going on uh, in terms uh, of the vessel. Uh, there's been rumors and discussions about this, but again, I've seen no evidence about this at all. But just to address it very quickly about evidence of, of the U.S. Navy taking over this vessel and storming the vessel with, with the potential of, of weapons of mass destruction on board. She was on a, a routine route coming out of China through the Suez Canal, heading up to Rotterdam, Felix Stowe, and, and Hamburg. She's not scheduled to go to Israel or, or the Mideast or anything like that. And again, uh, we're not sure what caused this accident to take place. As I mentioned to you before, we have instances of vessels losing power because of fuel. Uh, they were alleging the company high winds uh, and reduced visibility caused the incident to happen. So again, I, I, you know, I'd love to tell you rule out an issue, but, but uh, at the same time, uh, people with allegations really need to sit there and tell me where their sources are. Uh, for it. Yeah, there's a lot of coincidences with, with, with Evergreen and the call letters of this vessel. But again, that's, again, nothing more than probably a coincidence. So anyway, on a larger note, I want to share this with you because this was the story today just came out in G-Captain, which I found really interesting. Suez uh, Ripples raises rates for all container ships. This is a image here, not of the anchorage of Suez, that's the anchorage off Long Beach right there. Uh, one of the things you see there is a bunch of Costco shipping vessels. There's a Chinese overseas shipping co uh, corporation, CMA up there. There's an Evergreen right there. Uh, MSC, Mar uh, Maritime uh, uh, Mediterranean Shipping Company. That's an ONE. You always tell about a pink color. Another ONE over there. Uh, these are the vessels waiting to get into Long Beach right now. And one of the things we're seeing here is what we're going to expect to see happen here. So the Ningbo Containerized Freight Index, which is basically a measurement, and it's kind of what the Baltic Index was for shipping around Europe. This is the Ningbo does it for Europe to Asia, uh, Europe to uh, Asia to Europe, uh, sees it jumping here quite a bit, uh, which means freight rates are going to go up. Uh, look at here, uh, we see that the Drury uh, Index raises the rates up 5%, so it's about $7,852 to ship a 40-foot container from, Europe, uh, from Asia to Europe. Uh, usually it's around two, 3,000 tops, max. Uh, but we've seen this ex escalation in prices throughout this period of time. Uh, that charge gets spread across the cargo in the container. Uh, the other issue you have is because of the slowdown, uh, and what we're gonna see here is the ships that are supposed to be on berth are not on berth, and they're heading to berth right now. So you're gonna have a lot of vessels all hitting the berth at the same time, is they're gonna be in a big movement to get these containers off the vessel, new ones on and, and out. Uh, what that could possibly mean is empty containers which need to be moved back to Asia. There's a, a, a surplus of import to exports to Europe. 
so you have empty containers that pile up with no cargo in them are going to be sitting there and they're not going to be moved uh, because uh, empty containers uh, don't have the priority containers with freight tend to have the priority uh, but again people depending on who owns those containers may be able to get the vessel containers on the vessel so you get a situation where either the empty containers don't go in which case there's not as many containers available to load when they get to asia because those have to be offloaded or you have to ship empty containers, meaning exports from Europe are not being shipped. Uh, and if you don't send the empties, then you have to build new containers, which is cost right there. No matter what, this means disruptions in the trade and it means increased costs for consumers across the board. Remember from China to New York, East Coast of China to New York, it's 50-50 whether you go the Panama Canal or you go Suez Canal roughly. And since the Panama Canal has limitations, roughly you can only put vessels through the Panama Canal of about 12,000 containers. Uh, a lot of these boxes on these big ultra large container ships were routing through Asia, heading to Felixstowe and Hamburg for transshipment. Uh, as you see here, the CEO, Rolf Haben of ha uh, Hapog Lloyd, one of the big container companies, talks about the fact that a box availability will be tight for the next six to eight weeks. Uh, I should mention that the container companies are hitting record uh, uh, sales right now. Uh, absolutely just, just through the roof in this. And then you see the freight rates here in the Trans-Pacific Trans run right now running uh, actually less than what we saw the Europeans running at, at about 5,375 versus 5,868. So freight rates are really hanging in the Pacific right now. We see them spiking up here a bit than they were last week. And talking right here, the U.S. West Coast increased 4% this week. Uh, it's 251% higher than from the same week of last year. So freight rates are going up. And again, this is all an impact from what we've seen going on with the, the closure of the Suez. What I wanted to talk about was something a little bit different here and, and really kind of introduce you to something that I think is, is really uh, – unique and that is let's see if we can pull this up here there we go this is a couple of elements right here make sure i'm sharing this with you so that we got this shared here we go so this right here is the list of container companies with their capacity in 2004 so there's a couple of great books came out in 2006 on the 50th anniversary of containerization uh, one is mark levinson's book the box the other is Brian Cudahy's uh, book, Box Ships. And this is from Cudahy's book right here, Box Ships. It shows you the carriage capacity of the 10 largest steamship lines in the world in 2004. Uh, and you'll see the top 10 lines uh, carry about 52% of all the world's containers. At the top is Maersk Sealand. Maersk is the big uh, operator today. Sealand was an American company consumed by Sealand and eventually devoured by, by Maersk. Mediterranean Shipping Company, again, another big one out there. I think they're number three today in the world. I got a list that'll show modern here in a minute. Evergreen Marine, number seven. This is the owner of, uh, or not the owner, but the operator of Evergiven. Royal P&O and Ned Lloyd, they got consumed. Uh, they, they were uh, gobbled up uh, by another company. I'm trying to remember which company it was now off the top of my head. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking it was um, uh, either Hop Hog Lloyd or I think it was Hop Hog Lloyd. Uh, consume them. CMA, uh, C CGM, they're still out there. Hanjin Marine, they disappeared. They were they were consumed. They were basically bankrupted in 2016. APL got consumed by CMA. Uh, NYK, and then jump down there to K Line. They're all part of ONE right now. And then Costco, which is number nine, there is actually number two now. But one of the things I wanted to show you here is a quick comparison here. So this shows you the modern day as of as of yesterday, the number of container ships in the world, and more importantly, the number of of, of cells available out there. 24.5 million cells versus 7.5 in 2004. This is 15 years later. 15 years later, we've seen a jump of more than three times the number of cells that are available out there. The top 10 lines in 2004 had 3.9 million cells. Maersk, just Maersk alone today, 4.1 million. If you add Maersk and uh, Mediterranean Shipping Company, they make up the 2M Alliance. Uh, the 2M Alliance today has more container slots than the entire world did 
in 2004. This has to deal with the growth of the container ship industry. And one of the things that was started in 1956 with containerization was to get this kind of very efficient movement of goods without a lot of cargo handling, without having to retouch the cargo all the time. The problem is we have gotten to the point in the industry where we are too big. Even containers are not big enough to handle what we're doing right now. Uh, these vessels have gotten so big, they're in port a lot longer than container ships were supposed to be. The idea of a container ship was going for a few hours, offload and get on its way. Now container ships are in for a day or so to offload because they're so big to do it. But more importantly, they're held up because the infrastructure, while the container ships are, are able to move cargo and you can offload them, you know, depending on the crane speed and, and vessels, you can offload them. You got to get them off the port. And the problem is this number of containers, this three and a half times number of containers we've increased over 15 years, just clogs the system up. And that's what we're seeing right now. Uh, I think it's also interesting to note that the top 10 companies control 52.1%. The top eight companies, which are all in alliances here, excuse me, top nine companies, throw in Yang Min, the top nine companies here control over 80%, over 80%. We've seen a massive consolidation in the container industry. And each of these companies, again, uh, are, are unique. Uh, Maersk is a Danish company. Mediterranean Shipping is Swiss. Costco is Chinese. Uh, mainland China, PRC. CMA is French. Hapag Lloyd is, is German. Uh, ONE is, again, Japanese. Evergreen is Taiwan. HMM is Korean. Yang Min is, is uh, uh, Korean, excuse me, is uh, Taiwanese. So we see uh, you know, where this is. You know, back when you had Sealand, which is an American company, APL, which was not exactly an American company by this point. It had actually been consumed by uh, uh, Neptune Orient lines, which in, ten, in, in then was consumed by CMA. Uh, but you basically see really this shift to these large overseas operating companies, these nationalistic companies right here that, that are, are, are not in the United States but yet they control a lot of the ports, they control a lot of the influence in the ports since they have such a huge volume of cargo going through the ports. Uh, so when you look at Ever Given, again, an Evergreen uh, uh, marine sh uh, ship, uh, uh, Evergreen uh, has been around for a long time, uh, 1960s, late 1960s, uh, founded, uh, it's a big company in terms of Taiwan, uh, and it, it has had a large impact. It's been, again, one time the third largest container liner in the world. Now it's back down to seven right now, which if you see here, kind of hard to see in this chart, but they're undergoing a big expansion program. They want to jump up. They want to be in fifth place is what they intend to do. Now, I don't know what Evergiven does for that and this insurance claim uh, against Evergiven by other shipping companies and more important, the carriers, the uh, people who are uh, hauling on board the vessels is going to have a big impact. So, Thanks for tuning in. Appreciate you looking, uh, coming into another episode of what's going on in the Suez. Uh, be sure to subscribe to my channel. Uh, hit that uh, bell button so to be uh, alerted when new videos come out. And always a thumbs up. Always is nice. And I appreciate the, the comments and everything. Try to answer them as, as many as I can. I apologize. A lot of them are coming in. So thanks and uh, tune in for the next episode.